the scripture reading is from Acts 1 to 6 to 14. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood them, stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heavens? This Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go in, into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is uh, the Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. <clears throat> Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, uh, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James, all with these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So I think in the excitement of being outside today, because I really do like it when we have services outside, I think it's great. I kind of failed to uh, start out with our announcements as, welcome to Ascension Sunday. Today is Ascension Sunday. So in our scripture for today, we find Jesus appearing to the disciples. And as he is speaking to them, he tells them that it is time for him to leave. Now, the disciples are a little confused by this, what he's telling them. See, they want to know if it is now time for him to restore the kingdom of Israel. And the reason that they ask him that is this. It's because they still didn't, didn't understand what kind of Messiah he was. See, for generations, the Israelites had been waiting for a Messiah that was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. They were waiting for this Messiah to be a military leader that was going to drive out the invaders that had taken over their lands, their promised land. This is true when the Assyrians had conquered parts of Israel. It was true when the Babylonians conquered Israel and took so many people back with them. The people cried out for their Messiah to restore the kingdom. Now they had found themselves under Roman rule. And the disciples were thinking, okay, you've done all these great things, you've conquered death, now is the time for you to restore the kingdom. Right, Jesus? Well, Jesus tells them, no, now is not the time. That time will come only when the Father see, sees that it's necessary to restore the kingdom. He tells them that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, though. Stay tuned for more on that next week. And then Jesus ascends to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Leaving the disciples to stare up into the sky. Just like when he rose from the grave, angels came and asked the disciples, What are you looking at? He's not here. <coughs> However, I can't help but believe the disciples must have felt some sort of disappointment and that is why they were stuck looking at the sky. See, they had hoped and they had waited. They had been told stories of how the kingdom would be restored. They had met a man, not just a man, but God in flesh. And they had seen him do all these wonderful things. And they had seen him conquer the grave. And they had just witnessed him be taken up to heaven. 
If he wasn't the one to restore the kingdom of Israel, then who was? Now surely when he said it's going to be in the Father's time, the disciples must have thought, he means like five minutes after he ascends, right? It's going to be any moment now, any moment now. And so they continue to just stand there looking up at the sky. They must have thought, you know, I know he told us to go to Jerusalem, but we better keep looking just to make sure. And finally the angels come to them and they ask, what are you looking at? He's not here. You need to follow what he has told you to do. He will come back the same way that he left. But for now, you need to follow what he's told you to do. I've always felt like that was Jesus guiding them again. It's like when you're a parent and you have to remind a child, hey, it's time to get going for school in the morning. And then two minutes later, you have to say, hey, it's time to get going to school for the morning. And then five minutes later, if you're anything like me, if you don't get ready for school right now, you won't be doing anything after school. So, now, of course, what we find here is that the disciples had indeed missed the point. You see, they knew the Messiah, they knew his power, but they didn't, after all that he had done, understand what he was truly doing. See, he said he was restoring things. He wasn't restoring the physical kingdom of Israel at the present, um, what he was doing. And as he said, only the Father would make that decision when it would be done. But what he was doing was he was restoring the human ability to be with the Father. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, and then finally through his ascension, he was restoring our ability to be with God. And this was something that was so much more difficult to restore and so much greater than just trying to restore political order in a region in the world. And so the disciples do ultimately follow through with what Jesus told them to do. They go back to Jerusalem. And they wait again in the upper room. They name the twelfth disciple again to take the place of Judas Iscariot. But do we not do the same thing that the disciples did that day? Do we not find ourselves being directed by Jesus and then simply stare up at the sky? Or more than likely for us, stare down at our shoes? See, we've talked about what it means and how when we are called, we should be willing to go and follow what we are called to do. But how often do we find ourselves saying to God, are you sure? Maybe I should drag my feet a little bit more. Maybe if I do that long enough, this call will just go away. But let us not make that same mistake that the disciples made and force the Lord to send us angels to tell us, hey, it's time to get moving. There is good news, though. We see that the disciples will finally begin to understand what Jesus was talking about when the day of Pentecost comes for them and they get and they get the power of the Holy Spirit. So what does the ascension of Christ mean for us in our world today? Well, there are many people that will actually point to the ascension story as a reason not to believe in Christ. Now those of us that believe, those of us that have grown up in the church, those of us that have heard this story, we see the Ascension story as a mighty act. And we find it strange that someone could view Christ ascending to heaven and say that is proof that there is no heaven. That is proof that there is no Christ. That is proof that Christ wasn't who he said he was. So what is it about the Ascension story that causes people not to believe? Well, they look at the story and they say, that this is something that only would have made sense in ancient times when it was written. It was something that would have only made sense to people that had a limited understanding of the universe. But we that live in a modern world where we have seen so much more of the cosmos than those people could have ever imagined during the time that Jesus ascended, those people, they say, if Jesus went to heaven and he ascended up, then why can't we see it? Well, first, I think we need to clarify this point. We were never told that Jesus is going to a place that's just directly above the earth. He never said that he was going to ascend to a physical kingdom that can be seen with the use of telescopes hundreds and thousands of years into the future. No, he said he was going and he was going to be at the right hand of God. 
And we that have faith, we can accept this. I am reminded of the verse in John chapter 20, verse 29, uh, when Jesus was speaking to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think that we can also answer this question that people have by asking another question. And I know that anyone who studies logic or debate will tell you that answering a question with a question is never the way to win a debate. But this particular instance, I believe this question must be asked, and it is this. If we believe in a God that can create the universe, if we believe in a God that can do all these wonderful things, create all these beautiful things that we see on this earth, is it not possible that that God can create another place like heaven that we cannot see with our own human eyes? Now, for those of us with faith, it is something that we can accept. But those that do not have a strong sense of faith, yet it is something that they can find as a stumbling block. They will often fire back, well, if I can't see it, I do not believe in it. Well, there are so many things in this world that we can't see and we don't see, and yet they do exist. The intricate nature of this world and its many microscopic organisms is simply amazing. And I'm going to give you just one example of that this morning. You all have mites. Now, not mice, mites, M-I-T-E-S, mites. Specifically, you all have eyelash mites. Now, what these are, they are microscopic bugs that live in your eyelashes. They help to clean your eyelashes and move, remove debris that would make it impossible for you to see. So you see, there are trillions of other things in this world that cannot be seen, but they do indeed exist. But what do we do when we find someone that struggles with the ascension or the idea of heaven? Well, I'll relate it to you this way. <clears throat> Carlin loves to read. She is an absolutely vor uh, voracious lead reader. Constantly reading, uh, so much so that I often find her uh, when I come back to bed in the evening because I'm more of a late night person. Uh, she will be have fallen asleep looking at her phone because that's usually what she reads on. But the thing that she does that drives me absolutely crazy, and if you've been married for any amount of time, you know that there are things that will drive you crazy, is that she reads the <laughs> first chapter. She likes to read the first chapter of a book, and then she goes to the last chapter of the book and reads the ending. And I have never once understood how she can do that, and then go back and read the entire book. For me, I'm a very linear person. I need things to be in the order when I read them to feel like I really understand it. And if it's a book with a shocking twist ending, it's like everything was ruined if I know the end and how it's exactly going to happen. Well, when we see the story of the Ascension, when we talk about it, it can be viewed in the same way. If that is where we begin with our discussions with people about Christ, we are doing them a disservice by not laying the foundations for them, for them to understand how it would be possible for Christ to ascend. So we must be patient with people. We must make sure that they understand all the other things about Christ before we can even begin for them to be able to grasp the ascension. So let us do go forth this week and boldly proclaim the ascension of our risen Savior, but let us remind ourselves that we are given a blessing when we believe without seeing. And let us be patient with the people that might need a bit more convincing. After all, whether they know it or not, they are God's children too. My challenge for you this week is this. I want you to consider what the ascension of Christ means to you and your faith. Amen.